So why don't we start with you just telling me your name and a little bit about your background in this area. Okay, my name is Ted Ballard. Uh, my background, educational background, is technical in business. I retired in 94 as a senior member of the technical staff at Texas Instruments. And I've been involved in both surface and excavation archaeology since 1987. Uh, well, surface archaeology since 1983, excavation archaeology since 1987, and uh, <clears throat> was active on the working staff for the Robbins Museum in Middleborough from the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Uh, from 92 to 2015, and I was on a board of trustees there for 18 years. I'm still a member. I'm uh, legally blind, so I haven't done a lot of uh, outside research for some period of time. I stopped my surface research in uh, 2009, and I've had four publications on Native American ceremonial complex uh, theme in the Mass Ox Society from 1999 until uh, last fall. Uh, I get, <clears throat> I've lived in Rehoboth in this site since 1973, but I grew up uh, spent 20 years. I grew up in the Riverside section of East Providence that was part of the original southwest corner of the original Rehoboth uh, acquisition. And I was <coughs> lived there on and off for about 20 years, <coughs> and I lived here for about uh, 45. Uh, I re retired in 94, so I've been retired for 23 years. I understand that uh, you were involved uh, with the uh, uh, Toby site and the archaeological dig there to some degree. It's not far from where you live, I believe. Oh, as a matter of fact, it's uh, right in the backyard here on my neighbor's property on a glacial came. And I got involved in that in 86. I started digging in 87, so I was on the site for in excavation, so I learned to respect uh, the disciplines of excavation archaeology over a four and a half year period. Spent about 70 days on the site in that period of time. It's mostly done on weekends, and of course, I then retired in '94. I didn't really fully retire till '97, but uh, I'd spend either a Saturday or a Sunday there pretty much uh, during that period. So that's my experience with excavation archaeology. Mm -hmm. But well, I had an opportunity of uh, being involved with the museum to help one of the principal uh, investigators and do site analysis work from about 92 until the early 2000s, and he passed away. And uh, we couldn't find all his notes that he had that we put together, even the stuff that I'd contributed, until about uh, six, seven, eight years later. And when we found them, I started to pick it up again, and I got involved uh, uh, well, my neighbor lives in Jamaica. He owns a property with his sisters to live on the Cape. He's up several times a year, so we've had the opportunity over the years to talk about things. One of the things the uh, uh, the uh, chapter of the Mass Ox Society that did the dig, uh, used the Bronson Museum in Attleboro as the headquarters, and they met there twice a month and whatever have you, and uh, 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 just about the time they started on the dig, the Bronson Museum had to close and they put everything in storage because the building was being sold. And about the time the dig ended, six years later, they'd been able to move it to uh, Middleborough, renamed it the Robbins Museum. 
But in that period, the uh, the chap that was doing the digging uh, kind of fell apart because they had no place to hold meetings, and so the last couple of years, there were only four or five of us that were really doing excavation. And they had promised to the landowner to uh, uh, write up a report, actually got a grant to deal with that, and uh, part of the grant was used for some analysis data and some C-14 data. And <clears throat> once I got into the thing, uh, really probably about 2011-2012, I recognized, looking at the history, that the Society owed them a report. Well, that was published uh, this past fall, and I entitled it Toby's Site Revisited, because one of the things that uh, <clears throat> my neighbor Rob Toby was interested in is how the site fit into uh, the archaeology and the Native American culture, and so I was able to go use the resources of the library and reports to, to establish that there were half a dozen excavated sites basically from uh, the running river in, in what's now Seekonk, East Providence Line, uh, right at the head of Hunter Acre Cove, from there <clears throat> all the way to Middleborough. And and so anything I say here about things that we're reporting is going to be a combination of fact. If it's opinion, I'll tell you it's opinion. If it's uh, knowledge that I gained individually from research and laid out the hypothesis, uh, well, we'll state that mm -hmm. because I don't know anything, okay? Mm -hmm. I just only know what I've been able to uh, read, observe, look at, uh, use logic and reason to make assumptions and go try and test them. Well, well given that, uh, what does the Toby site tell us about the people who lived here? Say again? What does the Toby site reveal about the people oh, uh, who lived here? Oh, what it was, here? we had five uh, C-14 dates, uh, uh, two uh, around 45, 4700, uh, three around 45, uh, 4,700 uh, before present, and two in the 3630, 3650 area. And in 2013, uh, a gentleman from Rehoboth named Bill Swallow, uh, who lives about, uh, uh, his grandmother's house was Oh, about 2,000 meters uh, 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 west of here in Rehoboth. When he was a kid, he used to walk around the, pro the area adjacent to that, which was used for planting and fields and whatever have you want, and occasionally find arrowheads. And uh, oh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, the adjacent to the property to his grandmother's area, uh, was sold to a developer who was going to put in a strip mall. And he got an okay from the developer to go do a salvage excavation uh, using uh, uh, avocational archaeologists whose main interest in the excavation was to, uh, you know, see what they could find and anything they found uh, was theirs, kind of a situation. He did grid it out and assign the grids to different people. And so uh, he did have some information, plus his own data. And they found about 15 hearths there. Uh, one of them was in the area that uh, he dug with three hearths built one on top of the other. Uh, one of the diggers uh, took a charcoal, charcoal sample uh, from a hearth that was in his area, and got a C-14 date out of it that said it was uh, 3,600. Now, that's the same date as two of the dates that we found at the Toby site. 
So that was the first clue from a standpoint of how things might have been connected together. But in the reporting thing over the years, uh, uh, we had taken flotation samples from a couple of digs, had a report from those done by uh, Tanya Lager, who was a professional. Uh, uh, and determined that the uh, the site was uh, primarily a fall, early winter site from the standpoint of the uh, uh, the, the flora or fauna uh, <coughs> or, the, or the flotation samples. Uh, uh, she also did a 5,000 piece analysis of the bone that was there and that reports being finished up at the present time would be published uh, probably next fall in the Mass Arc Bulletin. And so in addition to the excavation data that we have and the reporting of the situation, so I decided to uh, uh, keep going with the project, was able to use the resources of the museum to identify uh, uh, half a dozen sites between uh, Seekonk and Middleborough. They're all in the alluvial valleys. And part of the issue from a most archaeology situation, they do a little bit of terrain report, but not much area report. And they don't take into consideration climate situations. It turns out this dig site is on a glacial came. The moraine is right behind us. Uh, it's identifiable from Narragansett Bay to Middleborough. And the rivers uh, north of the moraine run north and south in the alluvial valleys. And they run east and west in the middle up against it until they find a way to break through. And so that's true. Ten Mile River runs uh, <coughs> from basically the Bay Line south uh, into what's now uh, uh, through Attleboro and what's uh, now Pawtucket and Seekonk. And <clears throat> it uh, runs up against the barrier, turns around and goes and empties into the Blackstone. Wading River in Seekonk uh, is on the south side of the moraine and it uh, runs about uh, six, seven miles when you take a look at all the uh, brooks and stuff that feed it. And it runs under 100 Acre Cove. Uh, the Palmer River <coughs> starts uh, just about the northern boundary of uh, Rehoboth at the present time. Uh, <coughs> there are two branches uh, that run north and south in two of the uh, alluvial plains. Uh, and uh, join together in the middle of town, run east and west until they break through the glacier and then run south, uh, emptying into uh, Narragansett Bay in the area between uh, 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 what's present day Swansea yeah. and, uh, and the place where the four towns come together in that general area. Right. And then you go a little east, and the Taunton River runs north and south between Dighton and Berkeley. Uh, you go over the hill from Berkeley to the other side, you get S. Swamps Pond, which is the largest pond in uh, Massachusetts, largest body of water. And that runs uh, north and joins up with the Ten Mile River. And, and, and the river is called. Uh, uh, Oh, God, I should say it. Uh, Namaskat, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so it just so happens that I've got a half a dozen uh, native habitation sites that are habitation sites for high density that are dated the same dates as the Toby site, 4,700 time, time frame, 3,600 time frame. Uh, with uh, reports on several of them uh, in the Massachusetts Archaeological Society Bulletin or in, or in the Society uh, records. And a couple of uh, the sites, one on the Taunton River and the one here in Rehoboth that were done by uh, avocationals. 
And the data basically says that uh, 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 at the Wampanoag site in Middleborough, that swamps of pond, there's comparative typology data that says the points somebody was wandering around hunting uh, 10 to 11,000 years ago, all the way, up, and <clears throat> there's resonance all the way up to basically what's called the, uh, the woodland period. Uh, which runs up the contact, and there's three stages of that. The uh, site in uh, on the Taunton River in Dighton also had artifacts that were dated through that whole time time period. Mm -hmm. The others mostly run from uh, transitional archaic through the early middle woodland. Uh, not much of the contact period, woodland period, for about uh, 1,000, 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. Because all these sites that were very nice for the natives to live in, that uh, uh, have a nice geological base, because the geology in the air, the bedrock geology, uh, from the Connecticut or Island line in eastern Massachusetts, and especially in southeastern Massachusetts, is a series of north-south waves, high ground, low ground, uh, mm -hmm. synclines, anticlines, the anticlines, the alluvial valleys. And the fact that they run north-south, when the glaciers came through, glacier came down basically, uh, it was a so-called Buzzards Bay lobe, uh, almost north-south, but it very nicely wiped out all the Continental, continental collision data, 250 million years, and everything that happened in between, push it out into the <clears throat> what's now the ocean or the North Shore of Long Island, uh, and uh, when it retreated, fill it back up with uh, sand, gravel, and of course uh, alluvial topsoil, and so. These areas also had, uh, where the natives live, were also great cultivation sites for us when we got here. And of course, we broke up the ground with plows. And so when you excavate archaeologically, uh, for a significant distance below ground, roughly in that 1600 year period before contact, uh, the artifacts have been turned over by the plow. People went and picked them up, made collections out of them. Now when they passed away, the family donated the artifacts to the Archaeological Society, and we've got uh, 100 plus thousand of them or more without real context other than by typology uh, of those artifacts that the archaeologists have had a chance to go look at in virgin soil. And so from an archaeological context, uh, their understanding of native culture is uh, from excavation. But the problem is that uh, based on the data that I've looked at and quartered and researched and uh, across the country, and I've used the Algonquian culture, which basically ran from Alberta and Canada all the way to Lower Hudson Bay, uh, <clears throat> till a major cold spell about 4,000 years ago forced people to start moving south and they carry the culture south. Uh, of course, still all basically not settlement kind of culture as we look at it, all uh, moving from one place to another based on the time of the year and the resources and whatever have you. Or hunter gatherer. But it moves mm -hmm. south, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, 4,700 years ago, 3,600 years ago, the culture here was the same way from that standpoint. But when we moved in and wiped out the evidence, uh, there's uh, structural components, stone structural components on the surface in this whole area that uh, have an organization to them. And I've been writing on that uh, subject since 1999, and it's clear that that culture was sky-based and sky-focused, 
and you don't find much out about uh, sky-based uh, culture digging in the ground. So I've had my uh, uh, conversations with the archaeological community for a long period of time. But the reason why I did this Toby site article is multi-purpose. Multi One, to fill a commitment to understand both my curiosity, my neighbor's curiosity, how it fit in. When I found out how it fit into the native culture, recognized on these north-south high grounds, it's where I found a half a dozen ceremonial sites, three of which uh, I have reported on. Uh, one of which uh, Ken Leonard from Lakeville had reported on in the Lakeville area, just before you get to Aswampsar Pond. And uh, another one that there's evidence in 1690 with a selectment of Middleborough after King Philip's War, uh, <clears throat> the area Aswampsar Pond became a major habitation site including some of the Ponkapog when they came back off uh, Deer Island after the war was over and they moved south and joined uh, the people here. It was a fairly large cultural site. In 1690, the selectmen of Middleborough uh, got excited because people were complaining about the natives doing ceremonies on top of uh, a drumlin that's right at the neck of the, of the access to uh, uh, the peninsula that uh, juts out in La Pond. And so the uh, selectmen decided they were going to go take that over in the usual method, and they found a problem. The land had been deeded by Tiskpukwin to several of his male family relatives and another piece on the peninsula to his uh, daughter, Betty, and so they had to go through the, uh, uh, the process uh, <clears throat> to gain access to the land. And when they did, they took and cleared off the top four acres of the, uh, of the, uh, the drumlin, which have been the area of ceremonial activity. And <clears throat> among other things, a Ponkapog went back uh, north there's a little sign on a trail up in Milton, uh, a little historical marker that says this is the path that the Ponkapog used when they returned from Middleborough. So, uh, on the high ground in between these half a dozen identifiable cultural sites, uh, three of the ceremonial sites that I had reported on, and the other two, uh, uh, one of which has been reported and written up, uh, the one by Ken Leonard, and then the observation from the, uh, <clears throat> the data on a book that Ken wrote called The Beechwood uh, Confederacy, which is about the early settlement of that, uh, of that uh, uh, area between the Taunton River and uh, uh, as swamps or pond. Uh, and so <clears throat> what I ended up with, the purpose of the article was primarily to do all of those things and also tie together the observation that the ceremonial sites are clearly in between the habitation sites. And <clears throat> one of those ceremonial sites, which is several miles south and what I call the Seekonks Incline. In fact, uh, you know, if you go out of Providence and climb the hill up onto the east side and then go across the other side to the uh, Blackstone River and you go across the bridge, uh, the North Bridge, and you climb immediately up the hill up in East Providence again, and then uh, you come down the hill uh, when you get over to the uh, Wading River area, which is basically separates uh, Seekonk from East Providence, then you go up on a little piece of high ground and run across and you come down to the Palm River and Rehoboth. In other words, the high ground, uh, north-south synclines that are absolutely perfect for observing the sky. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you take the buildings off, and mm -hmm. as a matter of fact that you can see the sky uh, uh, 400 years ago, which you can't see today. But the point is that we use those observation sites. 
you got data supporting that from uh, 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 one of these uh, ceremonial sites uh, uh, I've reported on is uh, sitting down in, in Barrington, the Native Point area, just on golf course property, uh, where there are four of these uh, U-shaped, looks like hearths, observational structures that are clearly pointed to solstice and two positions of uh, uh, one position of the dipper and another position of a known ceremonial date uh, from the uh, present native cultures. And <laughs> since I have uh, uh, C14 dates of 800 and 860 uh, from two of those structures that were in an area where the avocationals that dug it had recorded artifacts from basically transitional archaic into woodland, but there were no artifacts in the area of these hearths, and they had a very unique construction that they were all made of rounded stones uh, and in front of the opening was a small pile of smaller rounded stones and that's a symbol I found in other areas of, uh, of, uh, of the Native American culture. It's the open mouth of the serpent on the Ohio serpent which is oriented mm -hmm. to summer solstice so sunset uh, uh, sunset, as was one of these youth structures in Barrington, and uh, so I basically said, look, using the comparative uh, typology method that we used to say a stone that looks like one that we have dated to 10,000 uh, is from a cultural area of 10,000 years ago. And so what I'm saying is they already have these youth structure sites obviously from a ceremonial context on top of the high ground uh, facing in, in clear sky-based directions and then these uh, sites just a few miles north on the same kind of typo typography uh, that I don't have dates for but based on the constructs and the orientation and the comparative typology they're associated with that 800 year time frame at least uh, in the same way that that 10,000 year old point that you don't have a date on is associated with one that you have a date on. <clears throat> and so basically when I said Toby site revisited it, used the, artif the uh, article to just cover a whole bunch of things that relate to actual observation some hypothesis because I can't prove that people use these things for observation except for the accuracy of the observations. Uh, one of the sites over here on the Rehoboth uh, Dighton border uh, is a calendric site that there were uh, uh, eight structures associated with equinox, sunrise, and solstice, sunrise, and sunset. And the one associated with one of solstice, uh, uh, sunrise, was accurate to sunrise within two minutes of the actual recorded solstice, sunrise date for this area back in uh, uh, 1980. Let's see, 1989 when I made the observation. Mm. In other words, uh, the date on December 22nd for Salt to Sunrise was 10 minutes after 7 uh, on our time. Mm. And the date that I recorded the first vestige of the sun between two constructs, one vertical construct which was chopped in place, and the shape construct was the orientation with the observer sat across a little valley both on flat top ridges was within two minutes of the actual date of sunrise. And to me that satisfied me back then 
that I wasn't looking at a bunch of stones that a farmer carried up a hill and dumped on a hillside when he cleared his field. And so with no stone walls in the area and no evidence of any attempt to build any, and these were not uh, just miscellaneous piles of stone, they were shaped, U-shaped constructs pointed at significant points in the sun cycle that I was dealing with a cultural aspect that had uh, been ignored, or not understood, and criticized as being imaginative speculation, you know, speculation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and not accepted by the archaeological community, and to date is still not accepted, except there are some cracks in the in the uh, in the paradigm that are starting to appear. So that's the Toby site situation. So that's what we know from these excavations is that there were many people living here for at least six, eight thousand years or more. And they, the evidence that they've left is primarily these stone structures. Uh, the evidence they left is the artifacts that have been dug from the ground. And the stone structures are an adjunct to the excavation evidence that verifies that it was a sky-based uh, cultural uh, uh, society, and you don't find much sky-based data excavating. <laughs> and so the difference is that we've been looking in the wrong place to understand the Algonquin culture that existed not only here, but also existed uh, 4,000 years ago from Alberta to the southern part of uh, uh, Hudson Bay that started moving south in a major, major climate change period that existed from 4,200 to 4,000 when the uh, tundra moved south 150 miles, the boreal forest disappeared for a couple hundred miles. The time dates have been, uh, have been uh, uh, verified by uh, data from the Greenland uh, ice sheets and also happened for some, by some strange coincidence to occur with a 200 year period when the Nile Delta did not reflood. And it ended in the uh, uh, the die out of the uh, 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 Egyptian culture that existed in that period of time. The the old culture shits on the name, mm -hmm. but I can't say it uh, at the present time. Mm -hmm. And it was a worldwide uh, climate impact. Uh, and it had its impact I've, I've, I've here referenced as well. that in documentation mm -hmm. uh, in some of the articles that I've written for the references and whatever have you on it. Uh, the reference for North America is a, a volume called The Wolves of Heaven, written by a guy named uh, Schlesier, uh, a historian that was published probably in the late 19, uh, 1990s in that time frame that it's a well-known book, not available in, in most uh, library systems because it's, and it's, it's a Midwestern thing and it's not uh, basically in the context memory of uh, this area. Mm -hmm. But it's available. You could probably go find it on Amazon or someplace. Uh, very, very interesting mm -hmm. uh, situation. So uh, what happened? Um, when Europeans began appearing on the eastern coast, and how did it affect the well, people who were living here? I look at history as it's basically you can't deal with history unless you deal with culture. And so the, the pilgrims were a very, very specific variation of the European culture with them. That was different from the culture that the uh, 
Jesuit missionaries in Canada brought with them, okay? Mm -hmm. But the culture was, has a couple starting points. One of them, of course, is from an English standpoint, uh, you know, the Magna Carta, which is what, about 1215, but also about 1300 in Europe, uh, for 500 years, was devastated by a major climate change, which is called the Little Ice Age. And <clears throat> that's been written up. Uh, a guy named Fagan wrote a uh, very interesting book on that subject. I think it's Brian, but I'm not sure. And that's available to look at. But about 1300, uh, these sun spot intensity started to fade and the number of sunspots, they just didn't return or didn't, uh, the concentration just went downhill for 350 years to what they call the mortal minimum. It was a 60 year period from uh, oh, middle 1600s to 1700. But the coldest time in that period was just when the pilgrims came. But for 350 years, Europe had been devastated by the variations in climate caused by the combination of the sun energy redu being reduced during that period and the presence of several major, major volcanoes that further obscured the sky and reflected the sun's uh, left from the sun. And uh, uh, the first evidence for that was in the early part of the 1300s, very early 1300s, they had a three-year period where the rains in the spring in the Central Europe devastated and eliminated the grain crop. Hmm. And by the third year, a million people died. But it affected the whole availability of, of sustenance in, in, in Europe. Uh, not many years later, in 1340, 1350, you had the uh, Black Death of the bubonic plague, which started in, in uh, someplace uh, east of the Black Sea, was transported by probably commerce uh, into the ports in Europe and then through the whole of Europe. And it uh, killed 20 to 25 million people in, 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 in that combined area. Again, another major, major cultural shock. In the meantime, the, uh, the violence of storms and things and the dropping temperatures caused the glaciers in the uh, mountainous regions of southern Europe to return wiping out ag areas that have been reclaimed for agriculture, cutting down the agricultural basis in southern Europe. And in a similar period, the dike system that they used the Dutch to reclaim the uh, area from the North Sea, the dikes were wiped out and they lost a major portion of their agricultural land. And so a whole series of those things just really affected the availability of food in Europe. At the same time, uh, the climate kept getting colder and colder and colder. And of course, uh, one of the outgrowths of that, was, from the turbulent standpoint, was certainly the Protestant Reformation. Uh, we get all that activity from a history standpoint without any reference to the climate effects that had an imp impact on the turmoil. And the reason why the church, uh, that time the Roman church, started selling indulgence, which was supposedly one of the reasons for uh, Luther's uh, uh, protest, was that they needed the money. And so they were selling forgiveness of sins and selling out, uh, selling out our facts, candles so you could burn them, and statues that you could use to uh, revere. And of course the uh, Protestant revolution was the fact that the church has lost its way and it went back to the Bible as a source of Christianity. Uh, two different cultures, one the Lutheran culture in Central Europe, and of course the Calvinist uh, culture, John Calvin was French, 
um, started his training as a priest. His father changed it to, uh, to be a lawyer, but he still had his training and his situation and part of the objections and the, the tumult that occurred from objections to the church has uh, lost its way. Uh, he was one of the people who were evicted from, from France. Uh, from a theological standpoint, he was also a theologian where uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, Luther was not. Uh, Luther was an abbot, and uh, but the, the Calvinistic culture was mainly in Eastern Europe or Western Europe, excuse me. Uh, migrated out of. Uh, the area in eastern France and Switzerland migrated north into Holland. Uh, it went to Scotland first with Knox, which became what we call Presbyterian today, and gradually moved into southern England. And of course in that turmoil you had uh, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, 1492, declaring, uh, evicting the rest of the Moors from Spain and declaring Spain Catholic and immediately going out and kicking people out of the country who weren't Catholics or prosecuting them. And uh, Henry VIII said, uh, I'm now Pope of England. And you have the birth of the Anglican, uh, uh, English Catholic uh, uh, religious structure. And of course the uh, Southern England Protestants were basically Calvinist based, it came in later, uh, were also formed as part of a protest to the way that uh, Henry was running the church. So the pilgrims had all that background and one of the major impacts on the climate situation was all the small farmers in southern England, uh, you know, the king owned the, all the land. His lords or landlords collected the rents and people got small pieces of property that they could afford and uh, got their sustenance from it. Well, in the late 1500s, the climate situation was such that, that many of them could no longer support themselves on the little piece of land that they had. And so they uh, had to give up, if they couldn't pay the rent. And <clears throat> that was happening in a significant way and so the Lord's want started combining the areas into larger areas and it was converted to animal husbandry. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, uh, in 1585, I think, you know, an individual in England had no right to property. And in 1585, property rights were granted. But the problem was, there was no property to obtain, to get, okay, that you could buy in small ones, in small sizes. And uh, so in that period, uh, you know, uh, pilgrims uh, essentially uh, were heretics from the basic Calvinist structure because the Calvinist situation said that the pastor of the church is the one who is the intermediary to God, okay, and through the Bible uh, and, and through Christ. They express the, uh, the doctrines of the church. Whereas the pilgrims uh, were a group that said, look, uh, we can also talk to God, pray to God, and that was their basic heresy that caused them to be essentially evicted or move out of England to Holland, and they were there for 20 years or so until uh, the disruptions between England and Holland and the fact that uh, uh, in 1619 there was a reformation in the Calvinist uh, uh, church in Holland that went very fundamental 
and a combination of those things said uh, to the Pilgrims, we got to get out of here. And so they actually, uh, uh, trying to figure out where they were going to go, uh, decided that maybe the, the New World, uh, which basically North America was basically uh, uh, an English, uh, English uh, uh, claim for territory. Of course, the Spanish dealt with Central America, the Portuguese, the West Coast of Africa. They had already heard quite a bit about... Yeah, uh, and, and so my, my point is that the culture that they brought with them was a European culture that had been under turmoil for, for three, four hundred years. Mm -hmm. And so they came here with a, uh, a particular structure, it was a commune, there was actually a theocratic structure. There was no separation between church and state. And so they brought that here. And the way they handled the indigenous population, well, the way that Europeans handle it, is that, uh, you know, these people are inferior to us, they're ignorant, uh, they're not Christian. And so we got to convert them. And after surviving the first couple of winters, uh, and f finally uh, 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 Winslow went to see Massasoit in the spring of uh, 1623. And he arrived there, found that Massasoit was very ill. Uh, his people thought he was going to die. The Powells were praying to one of their native gods to uh, not let him die. And Winslow recognized what the problem was, uh, probably a, a, you know, a bowel blockage problem, administered to him for a couple of three days with some of his own medication, chopped up sassafras root, and as described, uh, you know, uh, uh, wiped the, the, the fuzz off his tongue and whatever have you, and Massasoit started to recover. So Winslow became a big hero. And so he spent some time there, at least a week and maybe a little more, in which he got a real good understanding of, of what the culture was, etc. And you go back to Plymouth and said, uh, look, we got two problems. One of them is we can't go convert them because uh, they don't have a devil. So the hierarchy in, uh, in Plymouth got together and decided that uh, they would make the god that the natives were, the powwows were imploring, the devil, and the powwows as devil worshippers. So the natives didn't have a devil. The second thing you know, that was involved, that while I was there, somebody let them know that uh, a tribal group up at uh, Wasagasa, up in Weymouth area, had been going around trying to solicit people to join together and go wipe out the Pilgrim settlement because during the disastrous, the first couple of the windows that were disastrous for them, they lost massive population, they were on starvation uh, uh, rations. And their solution uh, to the problem, because uh, people who were doing the growing complained they ought to have more because they were growing the food and the hierarchy settled the situation by taking the arable land and dividing it up among the families based on their size and saying, go grow your own food. And from then on, they had bumper crops. They had plenty of sustenance, uh, you know, the so-called maize, cost and beans, native sustenance, plus whatever. So they became solvent, uh, were able to take some of the surplus and go all the way up the, the Kennebunk River in their little uh, sail shallop, uh, you know, ship's boat. And, and at least in 1623, they made three trips uh, from September to when it was cold, traded for furs and used the furs to trade for English goods. And, and so the key things were they brought a completely uh, discordant culture uh, and brought the standard European methodology of treating indigenous cultures with them 
And starting in 1623, uh, the term devil worshiping savages carried through to almost this day today. I have people that are friends of mine when they ask me what I've been doing on some of this stuff. They clam right up and don't want to deal with it because the natives were devil worshiping savages. And that's, uh, you know, uh, so the religious bias. Not a holes on archaeology, but it holds in our population. And uh, the results of that first decision that the pilgrims made just reverberated across the country and still exists in the way in which we've uh, essentially treated the indigenous populations. But that's a combination of things being the source of it, the European methodology and the way the pilgrims dealt with it from a religious standpoint. And uh, so that's my opinion on data that I've looked at, collected, my experience of the situation, how the culture has not been recognized in the Northeast as a sky-based culture. And uh, very interesting, some of my resources include a couple of the, the Jesuit relations reports from 1626 and 1636 that support that uh, sky-based origin. And the 1636 one also deals with the creation uh, story uh, of the Algonquins, in this case the Hurons, that has also been picked up and modified by the Iroquois, uh, and that's part of their creation story. But in that, the Jesuit compares the fact that uh, you know, the woman uh, 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 the story basically is a woman from the other side was pregnant, was out walking her dog, and the dog chased a bear, and she chased the dog. The bear ran into a hole, the dog followed, and she jumped down in the hole for, to try and rescue her dog, and the hole was a hole in the sky. And the bear became the dipper, the dog became the North Star, and the woman, the woman who fell from the sky. And the animals around saw her falling, convinced Turtle to get out of the water, and they dove and picked up mud from the bottom and put it on the turtle's back, and so she's able to land, on a, make a soft landing on the back of the turtle. Turtle representing the earth, and the water is representing the ocean areas around it. Uh, she gave birth to a daughter, and the daughter gave uh, a virgin birth to two sons. And those two sons are the, are, the, are the primary native helper gods in the cultural society. And I got documentation on who they were, both from uh, the, the Jesuit records as to what they reported about it. And one of the stories is one of the sons uh, uh, either sent his brother away or attacked him with uh, a sharpened uh, bone or, or a piece of antler. And uh, from an Iroquois standpoint, uh, the name of the one attacked was Sapling, and the attacker was called Flint. Another name for French is Frost. And what you're dealing with here is Frost kills the growth season, Sapling is a representative of the growth season, and so one of the gods represents the growth season, and the other one, the, uh, the darker season or the winter season. And my opinion, uh, New Year's Day is uh, equinox, and the mother who gave birth to the twins died after she gave birth. So the mother was dawn, the two sons are, you know, light and dark, day and night. They were born on days of equal light, equal dark. Uh, the Iroquois god Frost, of course, uh, uh, killed his brother. Frost ends the growing season. So you start to put all these things together and you begin to understand a, a native culture. And one of the most interesting comments made by the 1636 Jesuit report is he compared the two two sons or the two gods to Cain and Abel, 
and the uh, creation story to the biblical Exodus creation. And I just thought that was an interesting situation because you go around the world to find this uh, light and dark culture and who the gods were. Uh, one of the Greek goddesses, her name was Dawn. Uh, you had Isis and Osiris, the Egyptian. Uh, Osiris gave birth to Horus. Horus was the son of God. You know, you go back and take a look at the origins of, of uh, a whole lot of our way that we deal as individuals in society from t recorded time and pre-recorded time uh, as to uh, the way in which uh, man has uh, essentially understood uh, his role on earth and how he got here, etc. And how every culture has adopted it in, in some way in which we call the religion of the culture. But uh, however you want to work at it, you know. Mm -hmm. That's so opinion, that's just based on observation and doing a lot of research and understanding some of the things early and bits and pieces fit together and fill in the holes. And over a 30 year period I've filled in a lot of holes. And what I'm really saying is the Native American culture here was a fundamental culture that we've lost several hundred years of being able to understand what it was to really understand more about our own cultures that we brought with us. So right. that's my preaching mm -hmm. based well, on just observation and, uh, and how things uh, seem to fit together. And I probably had a little advantage of looking at the sky-based situation than most people because I spent three and a half years in the Navy and I was a quartermaster. Quartermaster is a navigator's assistant. Before the days of GPS, uh, we went out in the morning when we had uh, a clear sky and at dawn uh, took the position of the stars, brought them to the horizon, took the azimuths, went to a standard catalog book called Bowditch and based on uh, uh, you know London Greenwich time and where we were and where the stars were and, and those reports and we're able to plot a position. And I understand that uh, within the past couple of years the Navy has reinstated courses in that fundamental positioning uh, capability uh, because of the problems, uh, potential problems with uh, uh, loss of uh, uh, our electronic for, based yeah, uh, right. you know, GIS positioning systems that we have today if somebody goes in a wartime situation and wipes some of them out. So they at least have a way to find a way around to the sea again. Yep. And so, so in that the world comes around. In that respect, we're not we're a sky-based culture uh, yep. ourselves. Right? Yep. What led up to the King Philip War, the oh, conflict oh, of oh, sixteen seventy five? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, <clears throat> very straightforward. The acquisition policies of the Europeans coming in uh, saying these guys don't all that land, uh, uh, our culture is different, we can use it better. Uh, you get more and more people coming, need more and more space. Uh, selling the land certainly was a source of income for Plymouth or the Bay Colony or whoever was controlling it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> Roger Williams Heresy consisted of two parts. One, that he advocated for the separation of church and state. And that was a heresy because, you know, the church was the state control the, uh, the uh, uh, local administrative, governmental administrative situation, plus uh, 
they control you through the religions as to what your belief systems were. And uh, Calvin initially uh, was kicked out of Geneva when he left France because he advocated for uh, the church not being part of the state. He advocated for the separation and they kicked him out and several years later they called him back and said uh, we'd like you to take over the population and our, our, our controls are not working very very well here. And he said I'll do it on one condition that the pastors have the right to appoint pastors based on their capability. You're not just taking somebody and making them a pastor. And yet if you look at all the governmental bodies in Europe at the time, uh, whatever the king's religion was, was the religion of the populace, was the religion of the country. And that went all the way down into the principalities and the city-states and whatever have you. Church and state were one. So the pilgrims brought that with them. And Roger Williams, when the main heresy was the fact that he advocated a separation of church and state. The other one was he really complained about the way in which they were cheating the Indians in the manner and the way in which they accumulated land. Uh, pay them a pittance for a piece of property and then go in and claim the rights to the property uh, uh, within that particular area completely. If the Native Americans had a uh, at a growing field in proximity to one of the English uh, settlement situations. Uh, and that was beautiful tilled land that had been tilled and used for a long period of time. You know, you didn't have to cut down any trees to get to it. You didn't have to uh, dig up the, the stumps or remove the rocks from the field. All you had to do was let your cattle roam free and they'd go eat up the gardens and the natives would have to move their garden. And when they moved it, you just go take over that piece of property. And now you could cultivate a land without having to do all the work to prepare it. I mean, just to symbol the kind of thing that went on. And gradually as they encroached on the situation, uh, even though we say, well, it was all purchased, it was all purchased, it was all purchased, the fact that the native populations have been wiped out by smallpox and other things just a few years before the, uh, uh, the pilgrims arrived. And, you know, the, uh, uh, the Boston uh, Puritan cultures came just a few years later, but what, six years later for the first ones and then uh, another 3,000 uh, by 32. Uh, so that was one of the situations. The second thing was the way that they treated uh, the Indians. And the classic one was the, uh, uh, the second problem that he brought back uh, when he visited uh, Massasoit was that the West Augusta group was uh, uh, looking to wipe out the Plymouth Plantation. So within a couple of weeks, Miles Standish and a bunch of his troopers, maybe seven or eight of them, and Winslow set up a meeting with the native group. And when they got together, uh, there was one of the native uh, leaders and a half a dozen uh, people that came with them. And they just uh, murdered them all. A couple of them got away, they chased them down and killed them. They cut off the head of the leader, brought it down to Plymouth and put it on a post. And said, this is what will happen to you if you cross us in any way, shape or form. And uh, when you look at how that proceeded and gradually you wiped out and took over uh, what little property that the, the native groups had and so there was unrest not just um, among Philip and, and, the, and the local native groups here 
existed throughout all of eastern Massachusetts up into uh, the southern part of New Hampshire, Maine, where there, were, where there were people involved. And so the war was not just a little local war. It started here, it started, uh, didn't quite start in Rehoboth. It started what, uh, where they took out a few people living on, on, on Squaw Papa Squash down at Bristol. Uh, they attacked the small settlement in Swansea that was up against the Palmer River. Uh, there were only a few people living on the Palmer River side of the Rehoboth uh, settlement at that time. And uh, one person, uh, well, two people were killed. One was a, uh, was, was a gal and, and her baby. Her husband was apparently down at the garrison house, you know, down there in North Swansea. And she was supposedly uh, killed by a native that she knew, an individual, that he murdered both the baby and her. Uh, uh, her family home was uh, 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 just up the hill on Lake Street, and they were down closer to the Water Street area, but everybody was uh, confined to the houses. And so by the time anybody got to try and help her out, she was dead. And there's no real detail on that, just a, just a comment. No idea who the native was or what the, what the association was. She supposed to help them in some way. Uh, <clears throat> there were two or three people killed uh, in the Swansea situation, a couple of guys that went off from the garrison house uh, to see if they could find out where the Indians were were killed. And one gentleman who decided to stay at home because he had the Bible to, to save him, and uh, he was killed when the house was burned. And that was in 1675, and the settlement up at the Ten Mile River uh, really wasn't taken out until 1676 sometime. And up there there were about 40 houses that were burned. And incidentally, that uh, Newman congregation, you know, when Roger Williams uh, was kicked out of uh, uh, the Boston area, uh, was in the beginning of winter. And so he wandered around for a while in the wintertime before he ended up uh, at that uh, uh, Ten Mile Road place where it dumped into the Blackstone. He might even have spent a short time at, at Plymouth, but he basically walked around during that winter time with a couple of companions trying to find a place to live and settle there. And very shortly after he settled, the people in Plymouth let him know that uh, uh, that was still their territory and that he needed to go onto the west side of the river because uh, and, and he was still within the bounds of their claimed, uh, 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 claimed territory. And so, suppose you got in a canoe with his companions and a couple of Indians and they just paddled down the river to Fox Point in Providence, went ashore there, and went up into the, in the high ground where the river, or along the rivers, and established the city of Providence. And that was in 1635, 36. And the thing we have to understand about the calendar, at that time, the English calendar, December was the uh, tenth month of the year. Uh, January was the eleventh, February was the twelfth month, and a whole bunch of days in March, so New Year's was March 25th. So everything you read, they talk about uh, uh, 1630, 31, 16... Uh, 67, 68, da 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 da, because uh, the English calendar wasn't changed until uh, 1750, 1752, when they adopted the Gregorian calendar. And the 25 days uh, was reduced to 10, uh, so that uh, it's basically a 10 day disparity between dates at any time of the year in anything you read in uh, uh, the Pilgrim records or any other records. Uh, 
uh, they're out by 10 days. They're 10 days short of the present calendar. So that's another little problem that we have in trying to do history to understand what it is. Uh, and so uh, the real problem was, was the way in which they treated the Native American culture, which was a standard European way of doing it. And as I said, the difference was in Canada where the Jesuits tried to understand what the culture was and what their religious beliefs were and meld them with Christianity. And that shows up uh, in the Penobscot Bible, uh, which was uh, put together by uh, Jesuits in coordination with the uh, uh, Penobscot stories. And so the Bible starts out, the Exodus in the Bible is a mix of the two cultures. And they chose that as a way of uh, introducing uh, uh, European religions into the culture. And they were much more successful at it than uh, the pilgrims were who come in and said, it's my way or the highway, you know, this is the way it's done. And so all those things led together, and so uh, uh, and it's interesting to note that uh, the first Taunton Purchase was done in 1638, uh, and it was a outline based on geographic effects. They started in the mouth of the Three Mile River, and you go this way, that way, you don't go to Wasona, you stay away from Titicut on the other side. In 1641, uh, Massasoit came to him and said, look, I got problems with the Narragansetts. Uh, I'm willing to, uh, if you take over this piece of property, I'll, I'll sell it to you for a very minimal fee. Uh, it's my hunting territory and I can't protect it anymore, but there's land that you guys can use for agriculture that I don't use anymore. And, uh, and so, that purchase was made it was uh, described as an eight mile square purchase uh, based on the mouth of the Ten Mile River, one mile north, seven miles south along the bay. Uh, Rehobo today is uh, closer to uh, nine and a quarter, nine and a half miles uh, in each direction of the original purchase. And what happened was uh, uh, when uh, uh, Plymouth purchased the Attleboro area from uh, Wamsutta in 1660, uh, England during the whole period that the pilgrims are here was uh, in a revolutionary situation. Cromwell was running England. When he died, they decided uh, to go uh, uh, reestablish a monarchy, invited one of the princes of France over, and the first thing he did was let the colonies know that he owned the colonies. If you claim to have any rights to property, I need to see the documents that, to show it. Well, they didn't have a document for the first Taunton Purchase. They didn't have a document for the Ahoba Purchase. So in 1663, they uh, had uh, Philip go around and identify the geological bounds of it. And the eight mile bound of Rehoboth and it's uh, just on the west side of Squanacock Swamp, which is just uh, a little bit east of here, on the, on the uh, north-south side, on the east side. And the north side was a mile and a half below the present line, uh, Attleboro line, because when uh, they made the Attleboro purchase, and when they assigned that to Rehoboth for administration in 1668, uh, Rehoboth negotiated with them, and by 1670 they'd got an additional mile and a half of that Attleboro purchase added on to the initial Rehoboth purchase, which gave you nine and a half miles north and south. 
And in the statement, Plymouth said, uh, you got to negotiate your eastern border with uh, uh, Taunton uh, because uh, that's the way you're going to settle between you, your two settlements. And in 1672, three years before King Philip's War, uh, Taunton and trying to get access, uh, uh, or Plymouth and trying to get access to more and more land, they essentially forced the purchase, of, which was the area of Dighton, which is the Taunton South Purchase. Uh, in a negotiation on that, uh, Rehoboth uh, picked up another three quarters of a mile or so to give the present eastern border. There's no documentation of that except in 1712 when Dighton was established in the South Purchase. The current Rehoboth Dighton line is the line uh, at the nine plus mile segment, you know, it's not the uh, 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 the eight mile segment. And it's my opinion those initial ones bound for all geographic because that eight mile segment uh, ends just on the west side of the high ground that uh, that separates Quanaconk Swamp. Quanaconk Swamp was used. Uh, supposedly used as winter quarters for uh, Anawan uh, to get away from the problems with the uh, uh, the cold and the winds and the open exposure areas in the bay. Uh, and uh, so at the at the time of King Philip's War, Anawan was captured in that space between the Eight Mile and the present border. Uh, that area was Indian Territory, and it looks like uh, his main residential site, one of his main residential sites was up on the northern part of Rehoboth, because that's where one of the ceremonial sites are. And the other ceremonial site is just over the line in Dighton, and that's an easy access to the uh, Squanacombe Swamp, which was the winter quarters. And <coughs> The site in Dighton uh, is a calendric site, Sultuses, and Equinoxes. Uh, the one in North Rehoboth, I'm not sure I have the whole thing because of where their property ran, uh, but it was primarily a, a, a summertime orientation, uh, again using Sultuses and Equinoxes and, and uh, one of the dipper related uh, positions. Uh, and one of the difficulties in these sites of, of dealing with them is that I found many of them, uh, when land started to be open and built on, they cut down the trees and started running into these strange structures. And so four of the 13 sites that I've talked about were basically on uh, land that was being developed that people knew that was working on it, found it out in their backyards when the trees were cut down. And uh, I got a chance to go up and take a look at it and just document what I found. Uh, four or five of the sites are actually protected uh, uh, in different ways. Uh, Borderland State Park is one of the sites uh, King Phillips Rock site in Sharon was owned by the town of Sharon. Uh, I got a set up in Groton. Uh, oh, let's see, let me step back a little bit. Uh, site in Foxborough, it's in the Gilbert Hills State Forest, and a site in Rentham, which is in the Rentham State Forest. And it's a Beautifully accessible site. Anybody wants to go take a look at this construction, their orientation, and, and uh, see how they're laid out. It's in the state park property, uh, and that area is right on the border of 495 and uh, in Renton between uh, Route 1A and Route 1. And it's open in the summertime, there's an entrance area there, and whatever have you. I haven't been there in 20 years, but it's still intact and it's essentially a cultural site that nobody's recognized for what it is as far as I know. I don't know what the history of Rentham is because I never got an opportunity to go take a look at that. 
But most of the town history are all about us. I look at the Taunton history, it's about Taunton. I look at the Seekonk history, it's about Seekonk since 1812 when it was separated from East Providence and whatever have you and reincorporated as the town that it is right now. Uh, Rehoboth history has uh, uh, one of the documents, it's an 1836 document, not written by anybody from the area, but written by a guy named Bliss, who worked for the general court in Boston, uh, an area where they had responsibility for deeds and property. And of course, at that time, Plymouth had been incorporated into the Bay Colony. And so he worked from a governmental standpoint on that, and he wrote in 1836. So, uh, and there's another history that was written in 1927. And both those documents have interesting things in it because they relied on the uh, uh, records of town meetings for high points. And so were able to put together uh, why Rehoboth and Seekonk split in 1812 and what caused it. It started out as a church-related problem on the fact that the people, a few people who were living on the, the eleven families living on the Palmer Riverside, uh, had to travel uh, five to seven miles in order to get to church on Sunday. If you didn't get to church on Sunday, uh, uh, you were fined. And of course, the only paths were native paths and some wagon roads, and so it was a real hardship. And so they petitioned for separation was turned down a town meeting, but finally granted to him by the Plymouth Court. And the, the uh, Palmer River Church was established in uh, oh, 1721, I believe. And of course, uh, the men ran everything at that time, and so there's 11 men who are heads of families. and. Uh, uh, it became a major bone of contention because the people in the Seekonk and the settlement of the Ten Mile River had objected to these other people uh, having a pastor because it was one government and the church, uh, the payment for the pastor was collected by a couple of assessors from the town who went out and a portion of people, or looked at people property, assessed the value and assign them the fee they had to pay for the pastor. And so you establish a new pastor, so that means the people in the Tamal River area are having to pay a section for the pastor for the few people who lived on the east side. And that started the discordance between the two sections of the original uh, Rehoboth area and eventually related to things get so bad that it was uh, 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 a major battle fight took place in town meeting in 1811, uh, unrelated to the church issue and the pastor's issue, but on another subject on uh, apportioning uh, uh, representatives to the to the Massachusetts government in in uh, in, in, uh, in Boston, and it got so bad that uh, uh, there's an argument about people not being able to cast their votes and it was the, and, and, the, and, and the article was uh, either one representative or five and they ended up voting for the five and people complained about they didn't get a chance to vote the ballot so it wasn't a true vote. And the thing got so bad that it was settled by the general court and they wiped out the, the vote completely, and the next time uh, in 1812, when the appeal was made to separate the two towns, that was it, it was it was passed. It was accepted. It was done, and, and the court assigned and it split it. So that 1812 separation started out basically as a conflict because people objected to having to pay for two pastors uh, when they only needed the one they had. It ended up as the two towns being two different settlements, uh, one with 
much more arable land, which is the Rehova side, and the Ten Mile River area. Uh, ending up in conflict with uh, uh, with Rhode Island, Roger Williams had to be settled by a 1664 commission from the king in England to come over here and, and settle uh, arguments between the two colonies and uh, when you look at the uh, Dighton Purchase in 1672 and the uh, uh, last purchase in 1675 over in Lakeville, in both those cases they wiped out the Native American rights to uh, four of the five religious uh, sites, ceremonial sites that I'd listed, uh, you know, one in Dighton Rehoboth and uh, one in Middleborough, and the one uh, uh, which which uh, 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 was just west of the Aswamsa Pond area in Middleborough, uh, and so the combination of losing their rights to property, losing the fundamental things in their culture is my opinion of why the war started. And we all think of it as being a local war, but it was a New England-wide law, and it wasn't settled up north until a couple of weeks after Anawan's capture, which was a couple of weeks after Philip's death. And uh, in total, about 1,500 Native Americans from New England were taken and sent out to the Caribbean and uh, even some back to Africa as slaves. And so the residual populations were essentially non-existent. And the few ones that were there, of course, have been in conflict ever since with us. So, I think we'll the war we'll... was a class of cultures, one said, I'm better than you, and you don't need all this property, I'm going to take it. No understanding of how the property is used, how the culture works, and didn't give a damn. And that's my opinion. That's an observational standpoint based on uh, facts, recognizing what the sky-based culture was, how it was used, and how the acquisition policy uh, uh, was a European-based uh, way they treated indigenous populations from Africa to Central America and uh, just the way the Europeans ran it. And it came here, and that was the, the culture clash that is that ended in the situation with the war, but has has never ended, and we still have treated the Native American populations all the way through in, in the same fundamental way. What happened after the war, and how have things um, been? left in terms of uh, treatment of Native Americans since that time? Well, an example, I guess, gets to be uh, uh, one of my documentations of what the culture was and what the society was uh, from a ceremonial standpoint is relates to the Delaware. In the Delaware, including the Pequots and the, what, the other branch of the Pequots called uh, Mo Mohegans, essentially when they migrated south, they migrated south along the Hudson River Valley. Uh, the group called Mohegan was in the area north of New York City. Uh, the uh, Pequots, New York City south and the Jersey area and the Delaware all the way down. And sometime in the late 1500s, the Pequots moved east into the eastern part of Connecticut and headquartered in Groton with one group. And the group run by Uncas was uh, closer to the Connecticut River. 
and in 1633, the smallpox epidemic hit Western Narragansett Bay and really hit the Narragansetts, hit the Pequots and all those populations. The intensity of that is not documented in any way, but in the same year, it also hit the Iroquois. And prior to 1633, the Jesuits had documented that there were about 22,000 uh, natives in the Iroquois Confederation from Seneca in the south all the way up to the uh, Mohawk in the north. And after 1633-34, there were about 7,800 left, almost wiped out the Seneca. But the general population decrease was around 60%. And, and so uh, the documentation on the first one that hit in 1616 before the pilgrims came might have taken as much as 90% of the population because it was a combination of different things besides smallpox as near as they can figure it out. But smallpox never went away, okay? Uh, in 1721, uh, there was a smallpox uh, thing that hit Boston or in that area. And the problem was that it had been recurring about every 12 years. And so the main people who were such, you know, uh, susceptible were basically children or people who had been born in that 12 year period. But the 1721 period was an 18 year gap. And so when you get 18 years from 12, you've got uh, girls being married at 14, 15, having families, having a couple of three kids by the time they were 18. Uh, 18 was the age in which uh, 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 a male was released from the servitude, uh, which was caused, uh, you know, his, his way he uh, learned a trade. He was subservient to whoever he uh, uh, was assigned to or worked to until he was 18 years old. And uh, in 1721, uh, it, it turns out that uh, Cotton Matha had a right-hand man who was really a slave who was born in Africa. And when the epidemic hit, he recognized what it was. And he showed Cotton Matha a little scar on his upper arm, and he said, the way we took care of that when I was a kid, you uh, took something from one of the people that was ill, like from a pustule, and inserted it into the body of other people as a form of inoculation. Uh, you got the sickness, but most people survived, whereas that very few people survived the other way, none. And so uh, Martha went to uh, a doctor that he knew in town, one of the major doctors in Boston, who happened to have a six-year-old son, went through the story, looked at it. The doctor decided he was going to save his son. And so he inoculated his son, the son survived, and he was excoriated by the population of the church, and oh, oh, and you know, you know, you know, you can't do that. And then finally, a significant number of people that did and so a lot of the younger people were saved in that situation. And Cotton Math went on to really study smallpox and be involved in it for many, many years afterwards. But the subject came up in one of the church meetings that he was at, and the suggestion was that they maybe ought to uh, also inoculate some of the native population. And he went into a tirade about these ignorant devil worshippers, et cetera, et cetera. They weren't worthy for them. So if they get it, fine. Uh, they ought to die anyway because, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, I don't say heresy, but, you know, they're not us. And so that's 1721. That's uh, what the, uh, uh, 
well after the revolution, after the country was established, etc. Uh, another example is in the early, very early 1800s, uh, preceding the War of 1812, <clears throat> the British and French were still contending for the situation in Canada, and the French, even though they had slowly sold the Western territories to the U.S. Jefferson was a president. Adams had been president at the time, was doing something else, might even have been in Congress. And the British were proposing to move the Canadian border down to the Ohio River to keep the French away from it. And so, uh, the government, you know, uh, Congress and President said, et cetera, said, look, we got to open up that Ohio area and get people into it right away. And one of the problems they had, there were four Native American groups, a group of the Seneca, another of the Shawnee, and a group of Delaware who had migrated to the Alleghenies after the so-called Pequot War in 1737, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, a representative group from England had come over and said, look, we got a problem in Boston. Uh, the Pequots are selling furs to the Dutch in New York, and uh, Boston was getting their furs primarily through the Narragansett, who controlled the Blackstone and the area from the watershed in Massachusetts, and they traded with Massachusetts uh, across uh, uh, the little valley where the Blackstone was over the hill into uh, the, uh, the Blackstone ran north and south. The Charles, one of the major tributaries of the Charles, ran north and south in that area, and so they traded through that little short barrier, like between Dighton and Rehoboth, over the hill. Uh, with Boston. This, this was and, in the 1600s, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and, and so uh, a group from England came over and said, look, uh, we've got to take out that group of, of Indians in Connecticut because they're supplying the Dutch with furs and the hat makers in England can't get any access to the European contact, no, continent in the market, because the Dutch own it. And so they sent out scouting parties around Cape Cod and, and checking how they were going to do that and recognize that the supply lines and the difficulty of dealing with the situation on the Cape was not the way to do it. So they went out to western Massachusetts and recorded, uh, or should recruited, a hundred uh, people from the militia and the battle cry was, you're going to go wipe out those devil-worshipping savages. Supposedly an English trailer had been, uh, had, had been murdered uh, and he was found on his boat floating in the uh, Long Island Sound someplace, and so they used that as their excuse. Uh, they recruited the Narragansetts that they had a relation with to help support them, and the Narragansetts, Narragansetts agreed when you go down and surround the village, uh, we'll uh, We'll sit on the outside, and any stragglers come through, we'll just uh, detain the stragglers. And when they watched what the British did, uh, 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 or the, the columns did, they just went and set fire to the palisade and killed everybody that tried to escape and just murdered the population. And about 50 of them had escaped, and the Narragansetts picked them up, but they withdrew in horror at what was going on with the English. And so they were rescuing those 50 people and bringing them back uh, to their own territory when a group of the militia came up, uh, stopped the Narragansetts, corralled the 50 people, the Pequots, brought them back to Garotten and shot them. So the Pequot War was a war between England and Holland and the fur trade. And that stopped the fur trade, which, uh, you know, uh, Help the situation in England. That was in 1637. And so the Delaware, who were Lenape, like the Pequots were, and the Mohawk, 
would recognize some of the problems they were having, and they decided they had to get away from that situation, and so they migrated over the Alleghenies. So in 1810, they were there, uh, and uh, so the federal government went to them and said, uh, look, uh, 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 we want to offer you guys uh, reservations or an option to migrate west into the western territories on the other side of the uh, Mississippi, Missouri area, where you've got plenty of land, plenty of stuff to you, and you can, you can uh, you know, run your own uh, culture. And each one of those cultures decided that they were in no way interested in uh, 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 becoming like the English and settling down on a sw individually on a small piece of property and having the English ministers come to them and administer and convert to Christianity. They chose to keep their own cultures. So three of the four cultures, including the Delaware, uh, went by steamboat from the Pittsburgh area in Ohio River uh, to Kansas City and then migrated west. The Seneca decided to walk. But, uh, the Delaware, now that was in the early 1800s. In the latter 1800s, there's a record of the Delaware holding the midwinter big house ceremony, which was the midwinter ceremony in sometime in the middle of January related to the first uh, uh, moonrise after December uh, 21st, after winter solstice. And uh, a group of the Mohegans who had migrated from New York, some had uh, settled with the Seneca in the Ohio region and migrated west to them when they went west, joined the Pe Pequots at that big house ceremony, uh, which had a, th a bear theme, and it was held at a time when the bear constellation, which is only visible in winter, uh, was visible through the roof windows of the long house, of the big house, and <clears throat> the uh, Mohegans brought with them the symbol of the dipper, and that was traced on the ground with the, uh, the three stars of the hunters and the dipper bowl, and four additional stars from an adjacent uh, 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 constellation including the star Octaurus, which is one of the major uh, ceremonial stars in, in the native culture, in the northern culture. That was traced on the ground. And so here we have a record of a ceremony, sky-based ceremony, conducted by the Delaware, who are basically Eastern North American Algonquins. And I use that as a reference, uh, saying, look, uh, you got to consider the Algonquin culture overall because the Eastern cultures were Algonquin and it shows up in the uh, migration of the Blackfeet and related Algonquin, Algonquins from Alberta through Saskatchewan into the Montana and they brought with them the, uh, the, uh, 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 the medicine wheel symbology which was dated to somewhere around uh, five to eight hundred years ago uh, when they finally settled in the Northwest. Uh, the Cheyenne uh, in the Mossum ceremony had symbolism that's related to the orientation of these youth structures that have a little pile in front of them down in Barrington. Uh, in their situation they didn't have stone so in their migration, which was based on uh, the uh, 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 the rise of the star Rigel, which is the left foot of Orion, the rise of that star uh, in the early summer 
in the ceremonial altar, they removed the sods from the earth. They went to the uh, Bear Butte up in uh, the Dakotas, came in, gathered from the plains for about a month after solstice, and ended their ceremony a month later with the helical rise of Sirius, which is one of the stars in which I recorded in Barrington, that star rise. And they took the sods that they took away from the earth, because the earth had to be the altar, and they arranged the stars or the uh, sods behind the earth in, in a youth formation opening east. And then they dug a little trench in front and buried a buffalo skull in front of the altar, and that was painted black and red. And then the, uh, the shaman drew a little diagram on the earth, a little symbol. And the symbol was just a uh, north, south, east and west little line, little cross. And he impressed four holes, one in each quarter, with a thumb. And he filled the upper ones with, with red, uh, reddish material, which is probably iron oxide and the lower ones were black material, red and black. So you've got red and black as a symbol. Uh, that symbol shows up in several other locations among the Osage, which were a plain Indian. Their summer god was called a Spring Boy. Uh, Spring Boy's bow and arrows were uh, decorated with the color red and his winter component, which is Lodge Boy, and the winter you spend your time in the lodges, uh, his is clothed uh, with, with black coloring. And so you have uh, what I call the, uh, the, you know, the growing season, the winter season, the light season, the dark season, the light god, the dark god. And so you have the names for the, the two gods in the Osage. Uh, you have a decoration that uh, of that uh, north, south, east, west decoration with the four uh, dots in it that were filled with the colors. Uh, uh, a gentleman named Phil Travers, who's a friend of mine who lived in town, was at one time a, 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 a congressional rep in Massachusetts. Uh, <clears throat> sometime in the late 90s, uh, went on a vacation to England, and while he was in London, went to the British Museum. And he went to the North American section. And there on display were one of the wampum belts that supposedly were turned over from uh, Anawan to church when Anawan was captured. They were delivered to Middleborough and apparently sent to England. And they're in possession of the British Museum, and one of them happened to be on display. And so Phil looked at it, took a picture of it, and didn't think any more about it, except they had symbols on it. And it was a wampum belt, so there were colors, the dark wampum and, and, and uh, the no-color wampum, the light and dark. Uh, a couple years later, he's out in the southwest someplace, uh, around the Hopi areas, and, and he went to a Native American museum, small museum, and the person that guided him around was talking to him and he looked at one of the displays and he saw this same symbol. You know, the, the, the north, south, east was crossed with four dots on it. And so he said to the gentleman, you know, what is that? And I said, well, that's uh, uh, an anti-Christian symbol. And what it really was, was a Native American symbol of the solstices, you know, north, northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest, a universal symbol that shows up on Metacomet's wampum belt. You recognize that it's one of the, that's that symbol. The one he uh, recognized in, in the southwest and the fact that in the ceremonial, uh, in the documentation on Cheyenne's uh, ceremony, the summer ceremony, which was a cultural ceremony, talked about their migration from the north at the time of the cold period 4,000 years ago, 
and they're ending up on the plains being rescued by the buffalo and the celebration uh, you know, the period. That same symbol being on the earth altar. And so what I'm talking about is that uh, the no question the Native American culture was sky-based. Uh, it was sky-based, as I said, like a lot of other religion things were sky-based. And I'm not going to talk about it today because uh, I believe I can trace the spirit path through the sky and understand that the dipper was a vehicle for the gods coming to earth and the uh, spirit being transported to the heavens. Uh, still doing research on that, uh, but it seems to tie together that their culture was in two ways sky-based, one on creation and the other one on uh, the path to heaven that the spirit actually took. You know, we say when you die you go to heaven, but it doesn't say anything about how you get there, okay? The local Native American populations now have smoke ceremonies that the smoke is a way to connect to their ancestors, because the, 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 the spirit goes into the sky. Uh, and yet, if we look at things and look at the, the star-based path and the points on the path, that have been able to document uh, at least three of them and the stories that go along with those three talk about the fact that the sky-based culture was not only creation but also death, how you got to the other side. Again, opinion, uh, observation, just putting stuff together. You know, I learned a long time ago from my technical background that when you got a problem uh, first thing you do and start to solve you get some kind of a hypothesis. And you can do one of two things. You can tweak according to that hypothesis or you can really try to understand what the problem is and as you go along you keep changing the hypothesis as you build up facts until you finally get to what the basic problem is and what the solution set is and how you go from there. And that's the basic way in which I put all this stuff together. Uh, documented stuff for comment. The archaeological community has chosen not to make any comment. They continue today in the Massachusetts Central Commission website deny any connection to uh, surface constructs uh, from a Native American standpoint. But they have never ever commented directly on my hypothesis or allowed any archaeologist to go out and study and look at it and either support it or deny it. So essentially been, uh, you know, you know and somebody says you're full of shit, <laughs> to put it bluntly, <laughs> you can delete that. Uh, I just never accepted that. I went out and found out why it wasn't, uh, both from a professional standpoint and in the avocational standpoints. Uh, so it was a challenge. That's so but, I just got on my horse and said, uh, you know, as these pieces come together, uh, what's the extent of them, how they fit together and what they are and what are they. And so it's my opinion, which so far has not been disproved in any way, shape or form right. by any professional. Well, I And wanted, I, even uh, I yeah. was a research director in Nero for many years early on and I stopped that because I couldn't get him to do any research because uh, since uh, surface stone contracts uh, were not Native American by fiat, there must be something else. And so a bunch of hypotheses came up with it was the Vikings uh, right. or the uh, 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 <coughs> the Templars that came here or with somebody else. And in one case, one of the persons on my research committee was convinced they were put there by aliens. <laughs> and And so and I just stepped down from that saying I'm in the wrong place. Well, th there are many hypotheses, but uh, yeah, and, I want to thank and no, you and, for and, and, and your just sharing opinion, yours. And, and yep. they're, they're a shared opinion without any data to support it. Yep. And so I just decided, well, if I got an opinion, I'm going to try and find data to support it. And I just decided, look, uh, guys, I'm, a, uh, I'm not doing anything for the, for the organization in this capacity, but I've finished my term as a trustee last uh, fall 
And so I'm still a member, still dealing with things, still communicating with people. Uh, and I got a few more things on my plate. And so I basically stopped uh, dealing there. I'd occasionally go to a program if I saw things. But uh, mm -hmm. the history of us says a little bit about religion, but not very much because it's a tough subject to deal with. Mm -hmm. And nothing about climate. Mm -hmm. And the major impacts on the migrations of the Puritans were climate and religion. Right. <laughs> and yet it's not stated any place in any of our historical record about uh, the situation of what the. Uh, right.